As is obvious to anybody who follows my channel, I love and use large language models and generative AI in general all the time. But what you might not know is the cost of using generative AI. Did you know that something like this costs something like this in terms of water alone? Yeah, it's true. So let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. I don't want to be a downer, but I think it is important for all of us to recognize that the, there is an environmental cost to using large language models, and that environmental cost is substantially higher than the traditional internet, which is already reasonably high. So this video comes out of a panel that I did yesterday at the University of Georgia AI Research Day on the ethical and environmental impact of generative AI, and in particular large language models, but also diffusion models and things that make cat memes and stuff like that. And while I knew there was a significant environmental cost, I didn't realize quite how high it was, and water in particular was really shocking to me. So yeah, basically 519 milliliters, so a little bit more than this bottle of water, is the cost of water to cool the data center to generate that much text. And if you think about a standard email, again, you know, just something along the lines of something like this, you're looking at only a few hundred tokens. And if you use reasoning models, which I do all the time, they can generate thousands and thousands of tokens for an answer. So the, the cost is, you know, even higher than this when you actually look at reasoning models and generative AI. It's quite substantial. And real quick before I continue, I just wanted to note I've got new glasses. These are actually office glasses, which means I should be able to see the computer better than I was before. If you've ever seen me with my older glasses going like this, it was because they were transition lenses and I had to kind of rotate my head up to get the, the optimal viewing angle. So anyway, hopefully these will work better. So first I'm going to turn to just a little part of a Facebook post that Misinformation sent me this morning that synced up perfectly with what I was thinking about doing for my video today. I'm just going to show a little part at the beginning. I will leave a link in the description. I don't know if this is on YouTube or anything. It's on Facebook, which is not ideal. But anyway, I'm just going to play a little part of it at the beginning and then I'll look at some articles that have a lot of statistics in them. And, uh, you know, it's bad. It's bad how much water usage you have. But as it turns out, there's other things that you'd probably do in your daily life that cost a lot more water than even large language models. This is on a cold water pressure in the kitchen. This is where I fill up water for storage. Those are the things we have to fill up to flush the toilets. So you can see the sediment from the data center. Wow, and that's just from the water coming out of your faucet. Yeah, and this is what's in all the pipes. Just the well itself is probably 20,000, and that's not counting any of the All faucets. the replacement yeah. of the fixtures and faucets and toilets way. and the lines that come underneath the house. It's overwhelming because you, f you really feel like you are up against this huge, wall that you can't penetrate. There's nothing that that you can do and they don't care. I'm here in Mansfield, Georgia, driving by Meta's new two million square foot data center facility. Facilities like this are being used to power things like ChatGBT and other AI tools that are becoming integrated into our daily life. So yes, there is an impact and it's not just an abstract impact. In fact, Mansfield, Georgia is not that far away from where I live. I live in Athens. So anyway, you know, we're looking at we're looking at people within the state of Georgia and obviously in many other places in the United States and around the world who are being directly impacted by the amount of water that these generative AI data centers are sucking down. And of course, if we take a broad Broader look, we're also looking at massive electricity usage and massive carbon footprint. In other words, exuding tons and tons of CO2 into the air. Today, I want to focus primarily on water, but if people are interested in this other stuff, if it's not too depressing, then by all means, let me know and I can do another video about the strain on the electrical grid and the carbon dioxide that is released into the atmosphere due to running and also cooling these power plants. So where does water come in? Water comes in to cool these power plants. These plants are, they run incredibly hot. I mean, even if you have like a little laptop computer or something, if you run something significant on it, like even a movie or a game, you'll feel it gets very, very hot. And of course, desktop computers. When you look at these data centers, they, the density of the GPUs and CPUs is actually limited by the cooling. Traditional cooling uses air cooling, so you blow air over these things, but then you have to have chillers. And those chillers use water that comes from the public water source because it needs to be clean water, unfortunately. It would be much better if they could just pull in, you know, like lake water or 
or river water or something like that and exhaust it. But anyway, they pull this water in from the municipal water supply. So it's actually taking away water that we could otherwise be drinking. And then that's exhausted into a body of water like a lake or an ocean or a river or something like that after it's used. So it's not really recycled. It's pulled in, it's heated up significantly, and then it's exhausted. And so there's, you know, waste heat goes out into the environment. That can have a bad effect on things like fish life and other things like that. We've seen that from nuclear power plants and all sorts of other power plants that pull in this water and exhaust it into the environment at a much higher temperature than it was pulled in. It has an effect on the local marine life and so forth. But, you know, what I want to focus on today is just the fact that literally they're pulling in municipal water, water that is clean drinking water that could be used for people to, you know, to <laughs> take a shower, drink water, things like that, flush their toilet, etc. And it's used instead for the data center and it's taking away a lot of that water that we would otherwise be able to use in the community. So to talk more specifics, I'm going to pull up a few articles from the past few months. This is from September of last year. This is a Washington Post article. Roughly a quarter of Americans have used ChatGPT since the chatbot's 2022 release. I'm actually I think it's probably more than that. But anyway, uh, there are those of us who are power users and use it a lot. And so you can feel much more you know, guilty about this use if you are, are so inclined like I am. As the article said, chatbots use an immense amount of power to respond to user questions and simply keeping the bot servers cool enough to function in data centers, again, takes a toll on the environment. While the exact burden is nearly impossible to quantify, the Washington Post worked with researchers at the University of California, Riverside, to understand how much water and power OpenAI's ChatGPT using the GPT-4 language model released in March 2023 consumes to write the average 100 word email. So actually this is significantly more than 100 words. So <laughs> more than one bottle of water. What it comes out to is about 519 milliliters or a little bit more than one bottle of water. Turning to this perplexity article that was written just a few days ago on April 21st, ChatGPT's high electricity and water usage costs millions. Recent studies reveal that ChatGPT's energy consumption is substantial with estimates suggesting the AI system uses approximately approximately 227 gigawatts of electricity annually to process 78 billion prompts. And that costs around $27.9 million per year which, you know, whatever, that's a cost that they bear and everything. But the more important part is, while also requiring significant water resources and, of course, electricity for cooling data centers. So as this figure, which unfortunately is a bit cut off, shows, creating one email is around one 500 milliliter bottle of water, 519 milliliters to be more exact. And it uses enough energy to charge an iPhone about seven times. And that's the Pro Max. That's the big boy iPhone. That's not even a smaller iPhone. And to put it another way, all of those queries use 227 gigawatts of power, that could fully charge approximately 3.13 million electric vehicles, which represents nearly 95% of all electric cars in the U.S. at the end of 2023, and it's much, much higher now than it was at that point. Now, that is one time charging this thing. That's not charging them every day for a year, but still, that is a lot. That's 3.1 million vehicles being charged from empty to full in the same amount of power that it takes these generative AI data centers to generate these 78 billion Applies. And again, to put it another way, the energy required to power ChatGPT for a year could charge 47.9 million iPhone 15 devices daily for an entire year. So that is a lot. That's almost 50 million iPhones charged up daily for every day of the year. Or again, put it another way, it could power 21,600 American homes annually. That is a lot of power. But hey, if you want to feel even worse, <laughs> this article will make you feel even worse. It's worth noting that ChatGPT's global energy consumption represents just 0.0008% of annual worldwide electricity use, significantly less, less than other industries like beef production, which consumes approximately 1440 terawatt hours annually, or about 6,250 times more energy than ChatGPT. So if you ever want to feel super bad about yourself, you can use generative AI to generate answers about how to cook the steak that you have in your refrigerator. And then you can be using all of the energy and all of the resources and feel extremely bad about yourself. So unless you're a vegetarian who doesn't use phones and never looks at computer screens and never uses generative AI, today is not the day to be feeling particularly good about yourself. But there is something of a bright spot here, and that is that the energy usage is less than we thought it was, you know, several months to a year ago. And of course, it's coming down because there are major financial incentives to these companies to drive the cost of these things down. If it's costing them, you know, tens of millions of dollars per 
year, just in energy costs, not even including the cost of purchasing all these GPUs, running these data centers, all of that kind of stuff. Obviously, they are, you know, inclined, they're pushed to reduce electricity usage, water usage, etc. Anyway, while previous reports claimed each query consumed approximately three watt hours of electricity, that is a lot, that would be 10 times that of a Google search, new analysis shows that a typical ChatGPT query using the ChatGPT 4.0 model actually uses only about 0.3 watt hours, so more or less online with a Google search in terms of the amount of energy used. And yeah, if you want to, you know, feel even worse, using Google just to search up something actually, you know, has a carbon footprint, uses water, all of that kind of stuff. So everything we do in modern society has a significant impact on our environment, on our electricity usage, etc. And very importantly here, energy usage varies with query complexity. Simple text prompts consume about 0.3 watt hours, while longer inputs of 10,000 tokens equivalent to a short paper use approximately 2.5 watt hours, and massive inputs of 100,000 tokens or 200 pages can require up to 40 watt hours. The reason this is important is because we are using reasoning models now like O3, R1, Gemini 2.5 Pro, etc. These models produce, you know, often 10,000 tokens to respond to a single query because they're doing a lot of research and reasoning and thinking about things. So that can, again, go up to 2.5, you know, or so watt hours of usage, which means, again, it's about 10 times the cost of a standard Google search. And again, here we have that 519 milliliters per email, that, that thing that we saw from the Washington Post. And the conclusion to this article is that things become staggering when you think about scale. If just one in 10 working Americans or around 16 million people use ChatGPT to write a single weekly email, just one, and we use a lot more than that, right? It would require over 435 million liters of water, equivalent to Rhode Island's entire water consumption for a day and a half. Each of these AI-generated emails also consumes about 0.14 kilowatt hours of electricity, comparable to powering 14 LED light bulbs for an hour. But again, for context, if you want to feel even worse than that, producing one hamburger requires around 660 gallons of water, equivalent to nearly 200,000 ChatGPT queries. So this article really hits on the fact that, that beef production is a particularly resource-intensive activity. You could do 200,000 ChatGPT queries for the cost of one hamburger in terms of water usage and electricity usage, etc. Then we get to this Formaspace article, and I will leave links to all of these in the description, of course, so you can read all of them. Investors are coming to terms with the reality that tools such as ChatGPT actually lose money every time a user asks a question. Fortunately, this means there is a significant incentive for AI companies to improve the efficiency of their AI offerings, yes indeed, which could also help reduce the need for increased power generation and water usage. One simple way is to ask the question of whether using a large language model is appropriate for a particular instance. You know, <laughs> in one case, if just doing a Google search would be easier, then you can save energy and cost by using that. There is also the question of which large language model to use. If you use a tiny little like two or three billion parameter model, it, because that's adequate to doing what you need to do, that uses a, t a lot less energy, a lot less carbon dioxide output, a lot less water usage than using one of these giant frontier models. So using a large language model that makes more sense to a particular instance also helps save money and environmental cost. And then of course there's optimizing AI hardware, which Nvidia is always talking about. Not only are the AI chipsets and boards primarily sourced from industry leader Nvidia, of course, costly to purchase, but they are also expensive to operate due to the huge amount of electricity required to run them and the cost to keep them cool, which as we've discussed, drives up water usage for cooling. So more efficient GPUs and CPUs and data centers means using less electricity, less water needed to cool it, etc. And then finally from this Byte Plus article, let's talk about some ways we can hopefully make ourselves feel a little bit better about all of this stuff. Ways to make this technology more sustainable. So this begins with things from the more corporate level, from the design of the systems and everything. More energy efficient AI architectures, of course, is very important, as is renewable energy integration. So in other words, instead of running coal power plants, instead of running gas fired power plants, etc., to try to power these things from solar or wind or hydro in combination with battery storage, stuff like that. And then just as importantly, developing these things in local areas. In other words, put the power plant next to the data center because line transmission loses a ton of electricity. If you generate something at Niagara Falls and then have a five or 600 mile or a thousand kilometer uh, distance between that and the data center, you're going to lose a lot of electricity in the high voltage transmission lines to get the power from Niagara Falls all the way to this 
this data center. Of course, the government can help here by mandating environmental impact assessments of these centers, establishing clear carbon and water consumption standards, which would help with local environments. You know, going back to the Facebook uh, video at the beginning, if you create these data centers and suck all the water out of the local water supply, you're, you're harming humans. It's a terrible, terrible thing to do. So there should be government mandates in place that, that have assessments before you build these data centers in order to allow those kinds of things to be seen in advance and for the companies either to reimburse the community to create alternative water supplies to beef up the water supply in that area or potentially not even to construct that data center in that area. And then finally, what can we as consumers and organizations do? We can be mindful of unnecessary AI queries. That's the number one thing. So if you don't need to do it, don't do it. Creating silly cat memes or something like that might be a lot of fun. And sure, you know, I mean, <laughs> I'm not saying live like a monk or something, but it's like maybe if it's almost right, instead of generating 10 more, just go like, yeah, that's good enough for just being silly and posting on X or, or you know, Instagram or something like that. It's good enough. In, in other words, don't generate more than you need to. Obviously, I'm not advocating we live like monks and go away from technology and don't use it because I believe that technology also provides a way out of these things. We can use AI to help us create better artificial artificial intelligence in the future that is less taxing on the environment and perhaps can even help with some of the environmental problems that it creates. Of course, if you want to do the research, supporting companies with transparent environmental policies is a good thing. Of course, advocating for sustainable technology development is great and promoting digital efficiency, whatever that is, that seems a little nebulous. But basically as a normal consumer, the fewer times that you ask a large language model or a diffusion model like Dolly or something like that to generate an image for you or to generate text for you, the less environmental cost there is. Is this something I expect a lot of people, including me, to run right out and do today? No. <laughs> I, I mean, I have to be real about this. You know, I love using large language models. I love using generative AI. I use it for work all the time. It's a very important part of my life. And so, no, I'm not going back away from this. But I think it is important for all of us to be cognizant of the fact that this has a cost and we can't just turn a blind eye to that. And we have to try to participate in, in creating an environment that pushes these companies to be better stewards of the environment, whether that's asking our government to do things, whether that's doing things from grassroots, or whether it's just you as a person decide to use large language models 10% less than you did yesterday or something. Whatever those things are, these are the kinds of situations that can help to reduce the amount of water usage, the amount of electricity, the amount of carbon that's put into the atmosphere. All of that kind of stuff can be reduced, but we all have to participate in that. It's not something that's just going to happen magically. Alrighty, folks, this was not exactly the feel good video of the day. Let me know in the comments what you think about all of this stuff. You might disagree with these the, with these uh, conclusions and everything. You might have alternatives for how we can potentially do a better job of being stewards of the environment while using these cutting edge technologies, etc. I would love to hear about all of that stuff. Just keep it civil. While you're down there, if you don't mind liking the video, it really helps other people to find it. YouTube's algorithm depends on that. And if you want to see more of this kind of thing and more optimistic videos about technology, and AI, etc. Consider subscribing to the channel, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.